Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this very special event for week two of Vienna's Liberty Amendments Month celebration. My name is Chuck Anderson, and I'm a member of Vienna Town Council. Liberty Amendments Month is the brainchild of our own town manager, Mercury Payton. We scheduled a four-week series of events that reflect on and celebrate the four constitutional amendments, the 13th, the 14th, the 15th, and the 19th, that extended the individual rights and liberties to more and more people. Today, we kick off our focus on the 14th Amendment, the amendment known first and foremost as the Due Process Equal Protection Clause. In the audience today are three of our wonderful representatives, Walter Alcorn, and give a hand, Walter, who represents Vienna, Reston, and other parts of Fairfax County on its Board of Supervisors, Vienna, uh, his own Melanie Marin, who rep re represents us on the Fairfax County School Board, and Steve Potter, my fellow Vienna council member. <laughs> Did I miss anybody? The due process provision has some of the most sweeping language of all of the 27 constitutional amendments. It states, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor to deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of laws. Since its ratification in 1868, this clause has been cited to resolve a number of critical social and legal issues, including segregation, search and seizure practices, and the right to representation by counsel in a court of law, just to name a very few. Judge Steve Shannon and I are the co-facilitators of the lectures and education component, component of this commemoration. When our ad hoc group was mulling over how to best reflect on and celebrate this important amendment, we knew that we wanted to do something court-related. Great political philosophers, especially the enlightened minds of Locke, Hume, and Francis Hutcheson, were among the first to enunciate the concept of individual rights and liberties. Many of these concepts were codified by our nation's first legislative drafters. But their true meaning and their enforcement, in reality, how they apply to us as individuals has been the responsibility of the courts. Choosing the case was actually really easy. Loving versus Virginia immediately came to mind. First, because the genesis of the case was right here in Virginia, and second, loving seemed a great choice because it was all about the right to marry, a fundamental institution in every civil society. Personally, I like it because it is one of those rare cases where the title itself, Loving versus Virginia, encapsulates the real human issue that was at the heart of the case. Deciding on the format, however, was a bit trickier. After a few initial drafts, we mooted our initial moot court idea simply because the action in the Supreme Court room is maybe not the best vehicle for illustrating the human element that lies behind each case. Instead, we settled on the idea of a question and answer format featuring two important individuals, one of whom was actually there and the other of whom had her life changed forever by the Supreme Court ruling. This afternoon, we are privileged and honored to have with us Philip Hirschkopf, one of the two attorneys who argued the original case before the Supreme Court in 1967. At the time, Mr. Hirschkopf was only 31 years old. He's a bit older now, I think. But he had already served as a Green Beret in the U.S. Army, obtained a degree in mechanical engineering from Columbia, and while working at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, earned a JD from Georgetown Law. After loving, Mr. Hirschkopf had an extremely distinguished and varied legal career, arguing for such seminal cases as individual rights as freedom of speech, 
the right to protest the Vietnam War, the prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment, and the right of women right here in Virginia to attend the college or university of their choice. Our second special guest is Eve Runyon, daughter of Vienna's own Gloria and John Runyon. I've just had the pleasure of meeting Eve, but I've known Gloria and John for many years, both Vienna fixtures, I would call them. Ms. Runyon is the president and CEO of Pro Bono Institute, a national nonprofit that enhances pro bono legal services by law firms and legal departments to improve access to justice. She joined PBI in 2005 to lead corporate pro bono, PBI's project to transform pro bono services in in-house legal departments. Before joining CPBO, Ms. Runyon worked as a lawyer at Skadden, Arps, Slate, Mager, and Flom in Washington, D.C., where she practiced energy law and participated in an externship program with the D.C. Legal Aid Society, where she served as lead counsel in cases involving child custody, child support, domestic violence, and tenant rights. One of the truly good and, for me, unanticipated outcomes of Liberty Amendments Month has been the coming together of individuals from so many different organizations in the greater Vienna area. Faith communities, as well as organizations focused on community service, arts, music, business, education, and other pursuits. Our planning committee Zoom meetings were pretty unwieldy, but LAM, as we called it, has provided disparate groups the chance to work together for the first time. As a result, in our first inaugural LAM celebration, we are offering over 30 different events or happenings to the almost 100 people on the LAM planning committee. And can you imagine a planning committee that large? The representing 29 different organizations. Thank you. The Young Lawyers section of the Fairfax Bar Association is one of those organizations that eagerly stepped up. The YLS exists primarily to help new lawyers establish roots in the local legal community. They support each other, and they also support the community. YLS activities include Lawyer Palooza. What's, what, what is that, by the way? <laughs> and a Toys for Tots holiday gift drive. With us today from YLS are Robin Nagel, Rebecca Neville, Rachel Rogers, Teresa Small, Jacob Stalnaker, and Leon Stern. They have drafted and will be presenting the questions that are a part of today's presentation. In addition, they will be providing important background of the case. I also need to make a shout out for Lee Kitcher of Historic Vienna, Inc. No one but Lee's husband knows how many hours she has put into making this inaugural Liberty Amendments Month a reality. Just a few months ago, LAM was just a somewhat nebulous idea. But once it passed the Virginia House and Senate, and the townhouse made it an official local commemoration, Lee rose to the occasion, and along with Lily Widman and Leslie Hermans of Vienna's Parks and Recreation Department, took on this huge task of organizing and providing leadership for this inaugural commemoration. She drafted the first version of the Liberty Amendments Proclamation that was passed by both houses. And I know that Lee took a particular interest in today's event and on it alone has spent countless hours working on how to convey the impact of the 14th Amendment on our daily lives. And last but certainly not least, serving as moderator for today's discussion is the Honorable David Bernhard, Fairfax Circuit Court Judge. He has served in that capacity since July 2017, having first been a criminal, civil, and appellate attorney in private practice for over 27 years. He has tried numerous jury trials and conducted many appeals. Judge Bernard has handled matters involving a wide range of issues, including the admissibility of technical evidence in DUI prosecutions, enforcement of Northern Virginia's toll road civil penalty cases, expansion of the right to counsel, and the policing of abusive litigation practices, to just name a few. One other person I'd like to mention is our delegate, Mark Keem, who has supported us 
immensely during this Liberty Amendments Month. I saw Mark come in. Where are you, Mark? Mark, thanks for being here today. This afternoon, we'll begin with a synopsis of the Supreme Court case, read by Teresa Small. Teresa will be followed by Leon Stern, who will read the opinion. We will follow that with a question and answer session to be moderated by Judge Bernard, who will offer up some final words of wisdom. So without further ado, let's get started. Other southern states, Virginia enforced a law that banned marriage between whites and African Americans. In 1958, Richard Loving, a white man, and Mildred Jeter, an African American and Native American woman, married in Washington, D.C. to avoid the application of Virginia's anti-miscegenation law, known as the Racial Integrity Act of 1924. They returned to Virginia to start their married life together. About six weeks later, the police found them in the same bed in their home at night. During the raid, the police were shown the couple's marriage certificate. This document became the basis for criminal charges against the Lovings under the anti-miscegenation law and a related statute. There was no trial because they pled guilty and received a choice between spending one year in prison or leaving the state for the next 25 years. The Lovings moved to the District of Columbia, but soon found themselves wishing to return to Virginia. Richard and Mildred grew up in a small town in Caroline County, Virginia. They were used to having family and lifelong friends around. So they returned to their home frequently with their three children at first, separately to abide by the court ruling that they could not both be in Virginia. Then, they kept their home in D.C., but lived sometimes part-time, sometimes full-time in Virginia, staying with friends and family. The push for civil rights in the early 1960s gave them hope that things could change. Mildred wrote to Attorney General Robert Kennedy, who contacted the American Civil Liberties Union, who in June of 1963, sent the Lovings to Bernard Cohen, a lawyer in Alexandria. Cohen filed a petition with the Circuit Court of Caroline County to vacate the sentence against the Lovings. When the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed, Mildred wrote to Mr. Cohen asking about the status of their case since she hadn't heard from them in a while. In response to Mildred's letter, Cohen stopped by Georgetown Law School to see his prior constitutional law professor, seeking advice. At the same time, the professor was meeting with Philip Hirschkopf, providing advice on a civil rights lawsuit that Kirschop had filed in North Carolina. He suggested that Cohen and Hirschkopf work together on the Loving case. After researching and drafting a civil rights lawsuit, Cohen and Hirschkopf met with the Lovings to discuss whether they should file a federal lawsuit claiming that Virginia's miscegenation laws, that is, laws against interbreeding, were unconstitutional. In October of 1964, they filed the lawsuit. The case would be heard in a federal court. Virginia claimed that states had the right to pass laws controlling all aspects of marriage, including the age one can marry, if blood tests were required, waiting periods, family relationships, race, and more. While the case was going on, the Lovings were allowed to live in Virginia. Before the lawsuit could be heard, the petition that Mr. Cohen had previously filed in county court had to be dealt with by the state of Virginia. In January of 1965, Judge Bazile entered an order that denied Cohen's 1963 motion to vacate the judgment and set aside the sentence. It was shocking to learn that at some unknown time, Judge Bazile had written a 10-page memorandum opinion going into lengthy detail 
about legal punishments, including banishment and racist opinions. In it, he said, and I quote, Almighty God created the races white, black, yellow, yellow, Malay, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. And but for the interference with his arrangement, there would be no cause for such marriages. And the fact that he separated the races shows that he did not intend for the races to mix, end quote. The court date for review of the validity of the federal lawsuit was set for January 27, 1965. It was the only time that the Lovings attended a court hearing. The court decided that Virginia had to first decide on the validity of their own law, and then, if desired, the federal lawsuit could be pursued. Therefore, Cohen and Hirschkopf appealed Judge Bazile's decision to the Virginia Supreme Court. Because it took the court so long to hear the case, they had time to extensively research laws and pass rulings and argue that the 14th Amendment protected citizens from miscegenation laws like those in Virginia. Despite this, in March of 1966, the Virginia Supreme Court concluded that the law was valid, but that the sentence of banishment was not. The Lovings would have to serve a sentence in the penitentiary. Fortunately, they could appeal this decision to the Supreme Court of the United States. It took until December of 1966 for the Supreme Court to argue, to, to agree to hear the case, which took place on April 10, 1967. Hirschkopf argued the history of miscegenation statutes and equal protection. Cohen presented the argument on due process. After Cohen's argument, William Marutani, on behalf of the Japanese American Citizens League, made an interesting argument on the application of these laws to different races. Robert McKillwain argued on behalf of the Commonwealth of Virginia. His argument was constantly interrupted with questions from the justices, particularly Chief Justice Earl Warren. McKillwain pressed conclusions from alleged studies suggesting negative effects of mixed marriages on society. He ultimately conceded, after extensive discourse with the justices, that the genesis of the Virginia laws was the domination of the white race. Subsequent to McCain's argument, Cohen made a brief rebuttal argument encouraging the court to strike all the statutes and a personal appeal on behalf of the Lovings. On June 12, 1967, the United States Supreme Court issued, issued its unanimous opinion written by Chief Justice Earl Warren in the matter of Richard Perry Loving versus the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you. So I'm going to start reading the opinion, and I'll be, I'll be reading it from basically the beginning of the opinion instead of doing the background, which was already handled by my colleague. Thank you very much, Teresa. Amazing. Uh, so if I miss up, if I get tongue-tied, please forgive me. I'm a little nervous with all the cameras and so many people. <laughs> <clears throat> so, in upholding the constitutionality of these provisions, in the decision below, the Supreme Court of Virginia referred to its 1955 decision in Nam v. Nam. Now, in Nam, the state court concluded that the state's legitimate purposes were to preserve the racial integrity of its citizens and to prevent the corruption of blood, a mongrel breed of citizens, and the obliteration of racial pride. Obviously, an endorsement of the doctrine of white supremacy. Now, the court also reasoned that marriage has traditionally been subject to state regulation without federal intervention, and consequently, the regulation of marriage should be left to exclusive state control by the Tenth Amendment. Now, while state court is no doubt correct in asserting that marriage is a social relation subject to the state's police power, the state does not contend in its argument before this court that its power to regulate marriage are unlimited, notwithstanding the commands of the Fourteenth Amendment nor could it do so in light of past cases. Now, instead, the state argued the, the meaning of the Equal Protection Clause, as illuminated by the statements of the framers, is only that state penal laws containing an interracial element as part of the definition of the offense must apply equally to both whites and Negroes in the sense that members of each race are punished to the same degree. So the state contends that because its miscegenation statutes punish equally both the white and Negro participants in an interracial marriage, these statutes, despite their reliance on racial classifications, 
do not constitute an in invidious, like I said, I'm, forgive me, I'll get tongue tied, <laughs> invidious discrimination based upon race. The second argument advanced by the state assumes that the validity of its equal protection, equal application theory, the argument is that if the equal protection clause does not outlaw, ah, sorry, geez, oof, does not outlaw miscegenation statutes because of their reliance on racial classifications, the question of constitutionality would thus become whether there was any rational basis for a state to treat interracial marriages different from other marriages. Now on this question, the state argues that the scientific evidence is substantially in doubt and consequently, this court should defer to the wisdom of the state legislator in adopting its policy of discouraging interracial marriages. Because we reject the notion that the mere equal application of a statute containing racial, racial classifications is enough to remove it from the 14th Amendment's prescription of eliminating racial discriminations, we do not accept the state's argument that these statutes should be upheld if there's any, possibility, any possible basis for concluding they serve a rational purpose. The mere fact of equal application does not mean that our analysis of these statutes should follow the approach we have taken in cases involving no racial discrimination where the Equal Protection Clause has been arrayed against a statute discriminating between the kinds of advertising which may be displayed on trucks in New York City, or an exemption in Ohio's tax merchandise owned by a non-resident in a storage warehouse. Now the state argues that statements made by the 39th Congress at the time of the 14th Amendment's passage show that the framers did not intend for the amendment to make unconstitutional state miscegenation laws. Many of the statutes alluded to by the state concern the debates over the Freedoms Bureau Bill, which President Johnson vetoed, and the Civil Rights Act of 1866 enacted over his veto. Now, while these statements have some relevance to the intention of Congress in submitting the 14th Amendment, it must be understood that the pertain to passage of these specific statutes and not to the broader organic purpose of the constitutional amendment. As for the various statements directly concerning the 14th Amendment, we have said in connection with a related problem that all those, these historical sources cast some light, they are not sufficient to resolve the problem. At best, they're inconclusive. The most avid proponents of the post-war amendments undoubtedly intended them to remove all legal distinctions among all poor persons born or naturalized in the United States. Their opponents, just as certainly, were antagonistic to both the letter and the spirit of the amendments and wished them to have the most limited effect. Now we've rejected the proposition that the debates in the 39th Congress or the state legislators which ratified the 14th Amendment supported the theory advanced by the state that the requirement of equal protections of laws is satisfied by just punishing all races equally. Now the state found its support for equal application theory in a decision by this court in Pace versus the state of Alabama. Now in Pace the court upheld a conviction of an Alabama statute under an Alabama statute forbidding adultery and fornication between a white person and a Negro, which imposed a greater penalty than that of a statute prescribing similar conduct by members of the same race. Now, the court reasoned that the statute could not be said to discriminate against Negroes because the punishment for each participant was the same. However, as recently as the 1964 term in rejecting the reasoning of that case, we stated Pace represents a limited view of the equal protection clause which has not withstood analysis in subsequent decisions by this court. Now there can be no question but that Virginia's miscegenation statutes rest solely upon distinctions drawn according to race. The statutes prescribe generally accepted conduct if engaged in by members of different races. Over the years this court has consistently repudiated distinctions between citizens solely based on their ancestry as being odious to a free people whose institutions are founded upon the doctrine of equality. At the very least, the Equal Protection Clause demands that racial classifications, especially sub suspect in criminal statutes, be subjected to the most rigid scrutiny. And if they are to ever be upheld, they must be shown to be necessary 
to the accomplishment of some permissible state objective, independent of racial discrimination, which it was the object of the 14th Amendment to eliminate at the time. Indeed, two members of this court have already stated that they cannot conceive of a valid purpose which makes the color of a person's skin the test of whether his conduct is a criminal offense. Now, there is patently no legitimate overriding purpose independent of racial discrimination which justifies this classification. The fact that Virginia prohibits only interracial marriages involving white persons demonstrates that the racial classifications must stand on their own justification as measures designed to maintain white supremacy. We have consistently denied the constitutionalities of, member, of measures which restrict the rights of citizens on account of their race. And there can be no doubt that restricting the freedom to marry solely because of racial classifications violates the central meaning of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Now these statutes also deprive the lovings of liberty without due process of law in violation of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. The freedom to marry has long been recognized as one of the vital personal rights essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness by free men. Marriage is one of the basic civil rights of man, fundamental to our very existence and survival. To deny this fundamental freedom on so unsupportable a basis as racial classifications, classifications so directly subversive to the principle of equality at the heart of the 14th Amendment, is surely to, de to deprive all the state citizens of liberty without due process of law. The 14th Amendment requires that the freedom of choice to marry not be restricted by racial discrimination. Under our Constitution, the freedom to marry or not marry a person of another race resides with the individual and cannot be infringed upon by the state. These convictions must be reversed, and it is so ordered by this court. So thank you, Leon, for doing that. It was terrific. Um, now we'll start with the question and answer uh, section for Eve Runyon and Phil Hirschkopf, um, and pass it to Judge Bernhard. Uh, my role as moderator, I view as uh, saying as little as possible, <laughs> so that these folks and these folks can talk. But at the end of the proceedings, uh, I have some remarks that you know hopefully will encapsulate what we've done here today. So you probably won't be hearing much from me until more towards the end. Uh, I think these folks have it well in hand. The pressure is on you, <laughs> law clerks. <laughs> you will be reported to your fellow judges, but anyway, I, I mean to your, your, your judges that you work for, anyway, all right. So uh, I can go ahead with the first question for Mr. Hirschkopf. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience and how, how you first heard about the Lovings case? Well, uh, I graduated law school. Uh, actually, I got my degree before I graduated. You could do it in those days. And I filed a, a major lawsuit in teacher rights in New Bern, North Carolina, the second oldest court, federal courthouse in the United States. And uh, I was meeting with my con law professor who was sort of got me into civil rights. Um, and Bernie Cohen came. We were sitting in the old faculty lounge at Georgetown Law Center and sent a note in that he was a prior student. He had a case. He didn't know what to do with it. Bernie had no background in constitutional law, or civil rights, or criminal law, or federal court. Uh, and we walked, he came in and Chet, our con law professor, uh, introduced me as his best student. I was not even close to his best student. <laughs> uh, as an, a veteran, I went to night school. I sat in the back of the class and read as much of the newspaper as I could. Um, but I walked over to the ju old juvenile court in D.C. with Bernie, and he told me about it, and uh, I was flying back to Mississippi. That was 64, the, some of the three boys were killed down there. And uh, on the plane back, I drafted a federal lawsuit on a yellow bed and sent it to Bernie, and he invited me up to his firm after that, and they offered me a job, and I ended up back in Virginia. I was going back to the New York area where I basically am from, but, and I ended up in Virginia. Um, and for Eve, uh, when when you were growing up, did your family um, 
discuss the Lovings case or the importance or impact of the Loving case? Um, so by way of background, so these are my parents right here in the, in the front, and so the Loving case was decided in June of 1967, and my parents were married later that summer in August of 1967. And so it, it certainly was an issue that directly impacted their lives and my life and my siblings' life. Uh, my mother's family is from Vienna, Virginia. Her family goes back generations before the Civil War. And so uh, the fact that they were not able to live in Virginia as a married couple meant that they were not able to visit my mother's mother or her grandmother or her siblings. They were not able to travel freely to Virginia. Um, and we as a family were seen as different and odd. And uh, the fact of my birth was a product of a criminal act. Um, and so certainly this is a case that impacted us tremendously, but it's not something that we talked about mm -hmm. growing up because it's, it's sort of the reality of our life. It's the, um, it's, it's the reality of our existence. And I certainly understood um, growing up the importance of loving and the realities of the circumstances and the realities of the situation. Um, I understood because people looked at us differently. I understood because of the color of our skin, our family was perceived differently and was, in many cases, treated differently. Um, and so we never talked about the case because its impact was our existence and certainly understood it, but it was not a topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. So this question is actually for Mr. Hirschkop. As a recent law graduate, how did you feel being tasked with such an important case only a few years out? Uh, I couldn't feel very much because at first we didn't consider it a very important case. When the ACLU referred the case to Bernie, they were looking at purely a criminal case. It was a criminal case with a criminal sentence and appealing the sentence. The Lovings weren't interested in being test cases or civil rights advocates. They wanted to go live with their family in Virginia and felt they had a right to do so. And the one-page petition that Bernie filed was basically on the sentence. Um, when, he, when he talked to me, I realized that it was a, a real trap for us, uh, that if we went back on a sentence and it was a resentencing, A, the original sentence was to a jail with a suspended sentence. The statute required a penitentiary sentence. And B, it was a total racist atmosphere, and particularly the judge, I heard his opinion the young lady cited, um, he'd give them five years in the penitentiary and they likely wouldn't have a right to appeal because they had pled guilty originally. Uh, so I, I determined after consulting some other con law, not that I was a con law expert, but after consulting con law experts, to file a three-judge court, and that's what I drafted for the federal court. Uh, once we got into federal court, uh, we had a big fight over the federal court keeping jurisdiction because it was in direct contradiction to the state court going forward, and we call a doctrine of comedy, the two courts to live together and which will take which case. Uh, so we're so tied up in the procedural aspects of the comedy argument, through January when we argued it in the uh, federal court in, in Richmond. And then when it went to the state Supreme Court, I argued down there, and Justice Carrico, Chief Justice Carrico, wrote a horribly racist opinion. I, I must say, in retrospect, he turned out to be a great Chief Justice. It took 30 years to get there, but it wasn't until we saw the Supreme Court opinion from Virginia that was a totally racist opinion. It, it cited Plessy v. Ferguson in cases that the Supreme Court had overruled over 10 years before in, in the... Uh, in the school case that we all know about, Brown v. Board, and the Davis case, which is one of the four cases in Brown, actually came out of Virginia, uh, that we realized it, of the momentous nature of the case. Okay, this question is for Eve. Um, Eve, did the Loving case impact your desire to become a lawyer? Um, it, it didn't, um, but certainly the fight for equality did. So my father's father was a lawyer, um, and he worked for the State Department, and uh, part of his charge was to push for the incorporation of 
international human rights into U.S. foreign policy. And he also worked very hard to bring an end to apartheid in South Africa. And so he was an influence on me and very much encouraged me and influenced me in my decision to go to law school and become a lawyer. Uh, this question is for Mr. Hirschkop. Um, you know, you just mentioned the Virginia Supreme Court opinion that Chief Justice Carrico wrote um, and, you know, how horrible it was. When you were before the Virginia Supreme Court, did you expect to, did, did you expect to win or were you, did that opinion kind of hit you all out of left field? No, what hit me out of left field was the part they reversed the sentence. Uh, it's hidden in that opinion. Most people don't realize that actually happened. And it was the thing I feared most, to have to be forced back to a resentencing. Uh, on the other hand, going to the Supreme Court with this particular case at that time was a real problem. Ten years before Loving, the Supreme Court had refused to review a case out of Virginia, straight on mixed marriage, the Chinese national male, uh, well, Chinese origin male, and uh, a woman who qualified as a white woman in Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, they wouldn't review it at all. Um, and there was a, a study done back in the 1940s or 50s by a, a Swedish uh, economist, Gunnar Myrdal, on race relations in the United States. It's probably the best thing written till recent times on race relations. And it pointed out the thing feared most in the South was the marriage of a, a particularly a black man and a white woman, but interracial marriage the thing they were terrified of. Uh, we actually quoted our, our opinion, the Supreme Court has quoted it since, uh, in our briefs. But uh, you know, I, I didn't know what to do with the Virginia Supreme Court back then. It just They were what they were. Um, what they wrote on Plessy v. Ferguson, because you had to see other opinions of theirs, they, were, they could have copied it from those opinions. But that they reversed the sentence was surprising. On the other hand, they had no choice. That sentence was the most illegal thing about the case, according to recognized law at that time. Sure. So this one's for, for both panelists. Um, what advice would you give to the, not only the next generation, but maybe the next generation of lawyers and young lawyers as well? Go ahead. You, you can. First? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I think is, is amazing about this case, in particular, considering what I do today. So I am uh, the head of a nonprofit organization that emphasizes pro bono legal services for lawyers in law firms and in companies across the world. And so uh, a firm believer in the value that volunteer service can contribute to individuals, communities, and in this instance, a nation. And so um, that is the thing that I think is from, from my perspective, is most important to communicate to, to young lawyers the importance of pro bono legal services, the importance of volunteering, uh, how meaningful it is to you as a lawyer. The example you talked about with Mr. Cohen having no idea uh, with regard to constitutional law and that not being his expertise, but being able to take on this case and provide such tremendous representation and have a real impact in the community. And so I think this is an amazing example of, one, our ethical obligation as lawyers, but two, the importance of doing this work for you as a lawyer and also an impact in communities. Yeah, I, I, I would add that uh, the way I got into loving actually is I helped found what was called the Law Student Civil Rights Research Council. Uh, I, I got into civil rights very serendipitously. I uh, as worked in the U.S. Patent Office. I was going to be a patent lawyer, and it was very boring. It's, it's a great field for people to love it, <laughs> but it drove me crazy. Uh, in the summer of 63, they had among the worst mass beatings in the South in Danville, Virginia. It was hard. We hadn't had the Pettus Bridge then, so it probably was the worst mass meeting uh, in the South. Uh, not going back to what happened in Oklahoma, you can't even comprehend that. Uh, but at that time, uh, I met with, I went down there, I met somebody on a plane, I just accidentally went to Danville. My, I met my con law professor on the street, and he invited me to go to Danville, and my wife was away at a family reunion, and I says, hell, I'll go to Danville, you know. I better than going to night school. And I met Bill Kunstler on a plane, a great civil rights lawyer, and 
he got me involved. When I got back, within a few weeks, I quit my job in the U.S. Patent Office. Uh, unfortunately, I went to work for a congressman in the House on American Activities Committee, but I didn't know he was on the committee at the time. Uh, <laughs> I thought he was on interior and insular affairs. It was a, a nightmare. He thought I was a communist, and I thought he was a, 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 a trumper. <laughs> Way back then. Uh, okay, I won't talk politics. Uh, but as a result of my work uh, in 1964 and 63 with the Lawson's Council, uh, what I was doing in 64 was supervising 100 students throughout the South. All office had our students that we got funded. So a lot of students came to me over the years, my work with them, and said, what do I do now? I want to be in civil rights. I don't know how many people came to me for jobs and said, I'm really interested in civil rights. I said, well, tell me how many times you've been arrested, how many times you've stood on a picket line, how many flyers you've passed out. What have you done other than intellectually say, I, I favor civil rights? Uh, and my advice to them, getting to the question specifically, was go down to the ACIU, go down to the right-wing groups, go to the left-wing groups, whatever it is that you're interested in volunteer, do work. Believe me, there's lawyers who need help, particularly back then. Uh, but it's still true now. Uh, get involved. Uh, you may not have that Friday night drinking or Sunday watching a football game. But it, it will help discipline you where you want to go and what you're interested in and what contribu contribution you can make. This is for Mr. Hirschkopf. Um, it's quite the experience to be able to argue in front of the Supreme Court. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how it felt afterwards, and did you expect um, the Supreme Court was going to rule in the way it did? Uh, first question is much easier than the second. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sitting on my desk at home is a picture my father and I that was taken on the Supreme Court steps they argued loving. That and my old dog are the only two pictures that have ever sat in my desk in 56 years. Well, 53, the first that we got to the Supreme Court. Uh, and over 50 years. Uh, it, it was momentous. It was strange because I had no fear. Uh, they give you that quill when you get in the Supreme Court. And Bernie wasn't sure what to do with his quill, and I, I told him it wasn't plucked off a bird that morning. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's an interesting thing. I still have my quill in a box somewhere. Um, but looking up at Chief Justice Warren and Justice Black and Justice Douglas and Justice Brennan and even John Harlan, the great conservative, uh, it, it was thrilling. It was uh, Someplace I, I felt that all the work I had done, night school and whatever, and, uh, that made it worthwhile. Right, there. It, it was exciting. Afterwards, we held a press conference. I closed that file and had literally nothing to do with Loving Case again for 25 years until there was an uh, award ceremony in Alexandria. We didn't want publicity. The Lovings were afraid of publicity. Their life could have been placed in severe danger, given the hatred of that. It was amazing there was not that expressed hatred that we saw overtly, not in Northern Virginia or Central Virginia. Uh, but the case was put away and I, I was deeply involved in other things at the time. Uh, so my question is also for Mr. Hirschkop. So earlier you mentioned other cases of interracial marriages and interracial relationships that came after the loving and were still being prosecuted and still required representation, but during your time at the ACLU, were there other cases similar to the Lovings that you worked on, or was the Lovings case the first one? I was, I was never at the ACLU. When we argued Loving, there was no ACLU of Virginia at the time. Uh, myself and a couple of lawyers from uh, UVA founded the ACLU of Virginia two years after the Loving opinion was written. Uh, there was an ACLU affiliate in DC, the National Capital Area Civil Liberties Union. I was on their board, but again, nothing to do with the Loving case, and I think even after I argued Loving. Uh, and the National ACIU, of course, was a very big organization as is now. But I did 
in the research come across other cases. Of course, there was the name v. name case I spoke about before. And our fear that given the response the Supreme Court had to Brown v. Board, with the governor standing in doors, and his, you know, uh, sending the uh, National Guard down to universities, uh, that they'd be too politically afraid to take it up. It, even, even that great, great Supreme Court. Um, and, and so there weren't a whole lot of them before Loving and Name. As Loving came up, there was a case coming up, I don't remember the name of it, from Oklahoma that had a much better shot than Loving, because Loving had that smear on it with that sentencing problem. There was always the danger to the Supreme Court, and when they got to talking about the case after arguments and bargaining back and forth to get the votes of the different justices based on a different opinions, might say we're, we shouldn't have granted review here because the sentencing is incomplete. Go back for resentencing. That was always a, a danger, much less a danger after I heard the Supreme Court arguments because the Chief Justice really did in the Attorney General, the uh, Assistant Attorney General from Virginia. Um, there was a, a case in Norfolk. Uh, they asked for the pleadings and loving. They were trying to get up there. Uh, and it was a case somewhere from the Midwest that is also on its way up. So there, there would be, even if Loving had procedurally been thrown out, there would have been a case before the Supreme Court. Uh, that they accepted it was a bit surprising because it was an incomplete record. I, I, throughout Loving, I viewed my position as to try and procedurally get this to the Supreme Court as cleanly as possible so they'd review it. Uh, this question is for Eve. Um, Eve, when we talked a little bit about how the impact that this decision had on your life and mm -hmm. that it was really your reality, what message would you want the next generation or the next generation of lawyers to know about the impact of this case that it had on law and, um, and life? Well, I think, No, as I, I probably sort of understood the significance of loving as a legal decision in law school um, when, when, when I'm studying the case and you know, understanding it um, within the framework of, sort of all of the civil rights laws and decisions of the 60s. And so you know, it's an important part of uh, this nation's fundamental premise of equal justice for all. Um, and so I, I think... Um, and, and especially you know, sort of this past year um, and, and recognizing this country's sort of focused and um, awakening around racial justice issues, um, that I think it's really important to understand the progression of laws um, and how one builds on the other and how one acts as precedent and brings about change for um, impacting lives moving forward. And so I think it's, Im it's important for people to understand how this sort of fits within the tapestry of civil rights law and how it fits within the tapestry of, of us trying to, as a nation, achieve equal. Uh, this question's for either one of you. Um, so I think we can all say that in 2021, the thought of there being, um, of interracial marriages being banned is uh, inherently wrong, absurd even. Um, is there a current controversy or something going on um, today that you would like to see in another 50, 60 years of us being able to look back and say, well, that was crazy that that was a controversy in the first place? Okay. <laughs> a whole bunch. Uh, <laughs> The last part of my career before I retired, just several months ago actually, I did a lot of animal rights work. I had taught animal rights law for a while at George Washington Law School. Uh, and I was PETA's chief counsel for 40 years since they began and deeply involved in it. And watching the change in our society, how we treat our fellow creatures is amazing. What we still do to them is, is just amazing. If you took the time or if you had access to the movies and the view animals getting slaughtered and what they go through to get to our plates and how effect they have on us. Uh, I see huge change coming in that. I see huge change coming in international 
acceptance. Uh, our our mental image has always been that civil rights uh, civil rights stop at our southern border, our northern border. But I don't know why some kid born 50 feet south of the Rio Grande should be condemned to all the crap they get, as opposed to a kid born 50 feet north of the Rio Grande. It, it made no sense to me. I would see a big change in Citizens United. It, it's a terrible opinion. It has no real validity. Uh, when you look at the facts, which Chief Justice didn't do in, in that, he left them open. Uh, but it's, it's destroying our, our political system. It could cost us our democracy. Ultimately, I don't see that happening. Uh, the Second Amendment case couldn't have been more wrong. It has nothing to do with that Second Amendment. And, but it's the philosophy, and, and it affects loving in a great way, it's the philosophy of the Supreme Court towards the Constitution and whether you take the Scalia approach or you take the Warren Court approach. Uh, loving, for instance, goes to mixed marriage. There's absolutely not a word in the U.S. Supreme, in the U.S. Constitution about marriage. There's not a word in the U.S. Constitution about abortion. The Supreme Court, in their wisdom, came up with the fact there are certain rights enumerated in the Constitution, enumerated in the Bill of Rights, and they're created by them because the written word. But there's certain rights so fundamental to a, a democratic society that the Supreme Court recognized that you're born with them and that they are protected by the Constitution, not created by the Constitution. Um, and that, going back to the Second Amendment, if you apply the Constitution strictly, we're talking about muskets. The Second Amendment had no idea of, of Stingray missiles or 50 caliber machine guns or of AR-15s. Uh, so to apply it the way it was applied is, is idiotic. It makes no sense unless we go back to musket law. And then religious freedom. Uh, our current Supreme Court is going to cut greatly into that. Uh, the activities of at least one major church deeply involved in politics is going to cause a lot of problems, which will be supported by the current Supreme Court. Uh, I look at those as three areas of great change. And so, um, so I, I will echo, echo your sentiment from the start. It's a long list. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and, and just sort of looking at uh, the headlines of today. And so, you know, there's a uh, big to do about transgendered rights. There was a Supreme Court case a couple of weeks ago that uh, dealt with the issue of um, same-sex couples fostering and adopting children. There's a lot of focus on criminal justice reform and voter restoration, um, voter restoration for people with criminal histories. And so, you know, there are a lot of things that are seen as as controversial today that I imagine in a number of years we'll look back and thought, why were we even debating this issue? Press. affords a right to sue, particularly, for example, in violation of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, where persons were given, persons can sue when they are accused of being terrorists and they're not, or, or such things. And the Supreme Court recently ruled a 5-4 to four decision, I think last week, that the Supreme Court decides standing, not Congress. Uh, that uh, that just because Congress gives you the right to sue, you don't necessarily have federal standing. You might have that in the state court. Uh, are you at all? From, uh, have you no. seen any of that? Or the, uh, the standing was standing an issue that you worried about, Mr. Hirschkoff, with with in loving. Originally, when I filed the three judge court case, it was it was, but uh, it quickly got down to just the procedural aspect. It wasn't clean enough to get it to the big court. We couldn't win it in the uh, Virginia Supreme Court. The three-judge federal court was clearly going to either hold jurisdiction and put us off by sending us back to state court, which is what happened, or they would deny jurisdiction. You've got to understand that, well, you understand, but they have to understand, <laughs> that the issue of marriage is a state issue. It's not a federal issue. The states decide whether you wait three days or five days or six, whatever the hell it is, 
to get a license, whether you need a blood test or you don't need a blood test, the type of blood test. All these are state laws. They differ state to state to state. Remember years ago, everyone was rushing out to Las Vegas to get a divorce uh, because their laws were different than the other state. This has always been a strictly state question. Uh, we brought it in and said, well, there's some issues greater than that in the U.S. Constitution that override this. Uh, and I suspect that's what, you, what that goes to. I did not read the opinions. I couldn't intelligent comment on it. So uh, I don't know if anyone in the audience has any questions that they want to ask, um, any burning questions. Uh, but we can open it up to, to the audience if anyone has anything. May, may I make a comment before you? Yes. Something has bothered me greatly for the Loving case that I've never been able to resolve in my own mind. It's our view of race. Uh, Loving has an interesting history. If you go back, many of you saw the great movie Showboat. Ava Gardner was in it, remember, and Howard Keel. And, uh, a great book, a great show. The score is written by my hero in life, Oscar Hammerstein. Uh, and they have a miscegenation section in it where Ava Gardner, is, who's a, she's mulatto in the movie, nicks her wrist and the guy she's with, he's a white guy, nicks her and they put him together and say, now he's Negro, is one drop of Negro blood. That's the racial theory, the purity of the white race that we still give into. Is Kamala Harris African American? Yes. Is she Negro? Well. Yes, if you take the old definition. But why doesn't one drop of white blood make you white? So I asked my panelist here. <laughs> 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 you have two parents from different races. Mm -hmm. uh, which, which race are you? Well, in society, we automatically say you are from the African American now, but what was the Negro race? We still accept those definitions throughout the society, and they're outrageous definitions going to the very core of segregation. Um, and th that's something for you to think about, that uh, Loving didn't resolve, and uh, we, we have made no great inroads in resolving. We, we keep those racial classifications as they apply in our society, uh, and they couldn't be more wrong. Uh, yes. If you have questions, if you can come up here, or, or you do have a mic. We need a mic so that we can get the people on live streams can hear the question. So go ahead. There seemed to be, um, it sounded as if the Loving case was a pro bono, taken on as pro bono. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. In, indeed, when they made the final movie, the one that came out more recently, uh, I met with Colin Firth, he's behind the movie's uh, representative, and they offered me a considerable sum of money to be the legal representative or consultant or whatever, and I told him I wasn't at all interested in doing that. Loving had always been a pro bono and would remain so. My question is, today, with all that's going on with Black Lives Matter and other issues, you see this, both of you, as another kind of historical moment, another transition point, like the Civil Rights Act of 1965 in cases like Loving's, or do you see it as, as not perhaps as significant? Go ahead. I <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll sort of speak from my work perspective. So. Um, after the, the killing of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, um, we saw the private bar. We saw major companies and major law firms stepping up and reevaluating how they support communities. Uh, there were huge donations that were made to organizations like the ACLU, like the NAACP um, leader uh, LDF, um, and other civil rights organizations. And the lawyers that I work with uh, rededicated themselves to racial justice. Um, and not only were these lawyers at law firms that are in the business of practicing law, but these were lawyers at Fortune 50 companies. 
um, and they were um, reevaluating how they interact within communities, and they were willing to make investments that they weren't willing to make before. And so, um, you know, one example. Um, while a company may be supportive of its lawyers giving back to the community, it's not getting involved in policy uh, disputes around criminal justice reform. Uh, and they were starting to do that, and they continue to do that. And so it does feel like um, this, is, this is more than just a moment in time, and that there's real potential for change. It, I have trouble answering be, because I have certain difficulties with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, my whole life basically has been civil rights litigation, and cases I've handled uh, throughout my career. But there's a real danger in overemphasizing the effect of race on police relations with minority groups. Uh, the real problem, is, well, everyone knows police departments are basically very, very segregated in, in, the, in, their, in their minds. Uh, it's take a while to change. We brought suits to change the whole prison system in Virginia, caused the closing of Spring Street, the penitentiary. And uh, we actually had a federal court go into the penitentiary and try the case in the judge marriage in Richmond. Uh, the hearings were in the penitentiary with a bunch of rapists and murderers. And, uh, but when he issued his opinion, it was the first statewide case against for prison reform in the United States. When Bob Marriage issued his opinion, those white guards from West Virginia, mostly West Virginia and the western part of Virginia, who are as racist as you can get, did their job just fine. When they had enough guidelines, enough people looking over their shoulder, enough people say, if you do this wrong, it's, you're going to pay for it. The main problem of police forces is the blue line. That's, that's the worst part of it. You look at just Fairfax County, we've had three cases of brutal murders by police. They're all white males who were murdered. There was one case, the guy was an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, or he was in a card game and an undercover cop came to his house and he walks down his driveway in McLean, I think it was, in a big townhouse, and he hands the money that they'd lost at the game and uh, some SUV guy jumps out or whatever the hell he was and with the armor and all and shoots him, kills him. Uh, he had a phony excuse. Uh, ben DeMuro's firm handled the case and we ended up paying a lot of money from Fairfax County. We had the case over in Rose Hill where a guy is standing in his doorway with his hands up and a cop 15 feet from him kills him. That cop was fired and I think he was prosecuted. But at first, the police force tried covering that up. And then there's the, the guy who tried to, evading the park police, and he got killed. Uh, so the, the problem is to overplay the race card in dealing with police. The, the fact of systemic race problems in the, across the United States, no one could deny with half a brain, and certainly in police departments. But there, there is that problem that has to be dealt with. Uh, and it's not dealt with very well. In the Chauvin case out in Minnesota, we saw they finally stepped up, very unwillingly, I'll bet, the chief of police and the, the guy who did the management. Uh, but we see very little of that in the other case. This is related to your question about forthcoming issues that we'll look back on and say why, what were they thinking, and also to the 19th Amendment. Um, what do you think will happen with the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment in the future? I, I'd need a crystal ball to answer that question. <laughs> I, I have no... I have no idea. I, I have stood on more damn picket lines for that one amendment than anything else in my lifetime. Uh, I represented now when the, the women from now got arrested when it first came to the Virginia legislature many years ago. Uh, will it actually ever be fully ratified? I don't know. I, our country is in such poor shape with, with the Jim Crow laws all coming back on voting. Uh, it's a disaster, but those laws are going to block 
real social change until we can fight our way through them, and it doesn't look something that will happen in the next year or two. Uh, so I, I don't know if you'll ever see an Equal Rights Amendment. You, you, you might see it in statutes that, you know, change things. I, there was a question before about, uh, or someone raised an, an issue before about the, the transgender community and the LGB community. Uh, it's funny, after Loving, we expected such reaction. There was none. Justice Thomas came to live in Virginia. He's living in Virginia. And uh, Colin Powell and all sorts of uh, the ex-senator uh, from uh, Maine who was the Secretary of Defense, the head of the Children's Defense Fund, her and her husband, Peter, they live here in Northern Virginia. It was amazing, and, and you look at it the same way with accepting homosexuality. It, the fight was horrible till, till it really broke open, and then maybe it helped Rock Hudson came out and said, well, it's Me Too time. But, uh, and I think transgender is going to be the same thing. It, it will be fairly accepted fairly soon. The society think, seems to fight those things and then back off, and they did with gay rights, uh, I think they will with mixed marriages. Uh, it'll be fought in the legislatures, though, and the Jim Crow laws are going to hurt us on that. Thank you. Um, I wanted to preface my question by saying that in my work on the Fairfax County School Board, we're trying to figure out how to facilitate discussions with students and families and staff about racism. Um, and in this climate, it's very heated. And hearing about your thoughts on transgender students in particular. It's been a wild week here in Virginia for our transgender kids. But I remain hopeful because we have youth and young adults who are interested in these topics of civil rights. So I'd actually like to hear from some of the recent you know, law school graduates and students about what opportunities have you had in your studies to talk about this issue? Is this an extra thing that you're doing today? Or is there um, a culture in your law programs that is really elevating the need to um, fight for civil rights? I can start. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Neville. I'm having a little trouble with this mic cord, so give me one second. Okay. Um, so I was, I've been in practice for a little bit. I was a prosecutor in Prince George's County, Maryland, and then I worked um, in family law here in Virginia. And when I was working in family law, our firm really sat down because that was when everything started last May. Um, and we sat down and really wanted to talk about diversity. We wanted to really figure out how we could impact our community and reach into our community. I ended up leaving and I now work at a nonprofit, um, the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys that works to train prosecutors and get um, more information. And we really do center on the big, our main, one of our main grants is the Safety and Justice Challenge that it's twofold purpose is to reduce jail populations and then reduce the um, racial disparities in jail populations. And they've been working for about 10 years and they've really been able to, thanks to COVID, um, to reduce jail populations. What's been interesting is as they've reduced the jail populations, the racial disparities in jail populations have actually stayed the same or risen. So that's kind of the next phase is how did we get here? Why is this happening and what can we do to address it? So this is something, I mean, I do pretty much daily and I'm talking about daily and so um, I have greatly and feel very privileged to be here and, and hear these individuals speak and I just feel so honored to you know, be part of this conversation. I can follow up. So m my law program in terms of speaking on racial issues, issues of gay rights, transgender rights, it was a very, um, it was a very progressive mindset that the students possessed. I went to American University, Washington College of Law. Um, during my time there, I was a member of and director of community service for the Black Law Students Association, and we definitely tried our best to make sure we were always attending events with other minority groups, other groups where people have been historically oppressed, systemically oppressed, such as homosexual individuals, people who are transgender. Uh, to be honest, though, I'm kind of still learning in that aspect. With my generation, it wasn't a lot, this wasn't really a talked about subject is when I was a kid, so I'm, grow I'm still growing, I'm still learning, and I th think my law program was very helpful in that, that they allowed us, or they kind of helped expose us to 
different ideals, different mindsets, different groups of people. I got, I, I ended up in DC, which is a melting pot of in itself, but I'm still learning. I'm still taking it step by step. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Teresa Small again. Um, well, we did speak about it in some classes in law school. I don't think it was as prevalent as the discussion probably should have been. Um, but I did have the fortunate opportunity to work on the Civil Rights Law Journal um, while at law school. And so we had a series of um, seminars every single semester um, and then just reading and editing and learning more about all the different aspects that can get that is related to civil rights. You know, there's a wide, wide variety of topics and um, current situations that could be applied. Um, and so mine may have been more of a, I guess, academic um, uh, situation of learning and writing about it. Um, and currently working at the court, you know, there's no, um, we're not able to advocate for individuals. Um, but I've learned so much, I'm able to sit in on so many different areas um, and see the different ways that also in some unfortunate instances you can see disparity in just um, that the cases we see and how people are treated um, and so it uh, it's definitely allowing me to grow as a person and to see maybe where I want to start working and what aspects so I, I think I there are just two quick points that I, I would make and, and the first is that I always sort of grew up thinking about lawyers in the community is showing up and becoming a part of events like this. So I know that this is a big part of it, and I know that the Fairfax Bar and the, and the Young Lawyer section wanted to, to be involved because I think it's a great opportunity to have these discussions in the community. Number two is sort of lawyers are supposed to do continuing legal education every year. And I know that part of that is there's a movement to sort of build into the continuing legal education, discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I, I know that, you know, lawyers are people too, and I think that <laughs> everything in society that's affected, everyone else has affected lawyers. And um, so I can certainly say that, um, you know, all of these issues are things that are front of mind for a lot of people. Um, and so it's about, like Leon said, learning and growing and constantly trying to listen, for me at least. Um, yeah, so I'm in a situation similar to Leon where I'm kind of fresh out of law school. I just graduated last year mid-pandemic, so um, have been clerking since then at the court. Um, so I don't have as much on the kind of current workplace discussions, but I do know as um, everything, you know, with the murder of George Floyd and everything that happened last summer and discussions were becoming more, um, I mean, they were just occurring more, more regularly. Um, uh, a lot of us were studying for the bar, but also trying to figure out how to figure out these situations. Um, you know, as a white person, I am inherently privileged and I don't have the same experiences that people of color, that black people have. Um, and so, you know, as much as I thought of myself as an open-minded person, I had to reconcile that. Um, and I credit my community around me and um, other people for, you know, we learned and, and grew together. Um, uh, our law school did um, has worked on that as well, and um, part of that um, that a lot of um, the alums were trying to do was to get a more diverse faculty. You have a diverse student body. Why are the people teaching us not also diverse? So I know our school has been working on that. Um, we had a public interest journal who just did an entire symposium on um, the uh, school to prison pipeline and how that largely affects um, people of color. Um, again, largely black people in the Richmond community, um, that's a huge issue. So, um, you know, it, it's been a year of, of tough discussions and growth, um, and I'm trying to stay involved with my school as much as I can in those areas because we can all still learn and grow, um, you know, whether that's on issues of race, but also, you know, um, LGBTQ um, issues as well. Um, I know our, uh, at the University of Richmond, they had a, we have a, um, public, I'm not even going to remember the, oh, the pro bono center there. That's, I was like, I was trying to remember what the right term for it was. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's Eve. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel really bad right now. Um, our director um, has long been um, trying to 
uh, get law students to volunteer in various clinics. Um, and I know there's been several for LGBTQ um, groups. I know there was one I participated in, but they've also been very active in ensuring that the law students are involved in issues of civil rights um, and just whatever uh, events in the community we can. So um, again, it's a, it's a learning and growing opportunity for everybody, but um, you know, onwards and upwards. And can I just say, so um, I was educated in, in Fairfax County, grew up in Vienna, Virginia. Um, and uh, after uh, the George Floyd murder, um, you may have seen on social media, there were these black at such and such school. And, and um, a lot of it was independent schools, um, but some public schools here in the Metro DC area. And it were students talking about their experience being a person of color or being a marginalized person within the school system. Um, and it happened in DC, it happened in New York. And um, I was really disappointed because the experiences that these students were talking about that were happening today happened when I was in school. Um, and there was sort of a consistent thread of, of what these kids were saying they were experiencing and how they were feeling or how they were made to feel. Um, and you know, you know, recently we had the incident in Loudoun County um, with the, the pushback and the desire to have a more inclusive curriculum and in, in teaching our students more accurately the, the history of this nation. And so you know, I would encourage everyone who's involved in education and teaching to be persistent and to really grab hold of this issue and continue to push for greater advancement with regard to educating our young people so that hopefully in 20 years, the kids who are being educated in Fairfax County will not have the same experience that the kids are having today and that I had when I was in school. If I, if I can add, you have to take advantage of the historical perspective. I probably am far older than anyone else in this room. Um, but this last young lady who spoke from the law schools just made this marvelous, marvelous, marvelous comment. Uh, I'm a member of a privileged class. For a woman to state that at a public meeting couldn't have happened 30 and 20 and 10 years ago. Uh, I went to practice in Alexandria, Virginia. The Alexandria Bar was segregated. The uh, Arlington Bar was segregated. Uh, Paul Sheridan made the motion to desegregate, and the, uh, the African-American lawyer he represented, uh, who a uh, main defense lawyer got up and said, we don't want any N-word lawyers in our bar, and the state senator Ball got up and said, they're going to join our country club. Uh, they were ruled out of, out of order by Dick Shadiak, and I'm going back now 54 years. But that lawyer, Paul Monroe, became the first African-American circuit judge in the state of Virginia uh, as an old friend. But when you go back to those days, I graduated law school or a couple of women in my class. Now, the largest number of uh, graduates are women in law schools and medical schools. Uh, there were no justices on the Supreme Court of women. There were no just on the state Supreme Court women. Uh, when I was elected to the Bar Council, I walked in the room with, I think, like 80 guys sitting around a table, one African-American guy, and we always did kid him a lot because he, he worked for the, the uh, Lewis Powell's old law firm in Richmond, and uh, so we said that they're all white guys anyhow. You can't change that with those. Uh, but uh, he became, Gray became president of the ABA at some point. But it was a room with... 80-some white males sitting around, and Mr. Gray is this table, and I made a motion every year. They, they went run for cover to integrate the bar. Fred Swirsky was my assistant. Then he's a retired judge from Alexandria. Uh, he would second it, and Paul Sher Sheridan grudged and put his hand up, and I'd lose it 20 to 5, because a bunch of people didn't want to vote. Mostly it was 60 to 2. Or The only professional woman in that room was getting us our coffee and things. She was the representative of the uh, Attorney General's office who represented the Bar Council, the governing body of the Virginia State Bar. And Liz, Elizabeth Lacey, went on to become an Associate Justice of the Virginia Supreme Court. But that's what it was like back then. We shouldn't lose sight of that. 
the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement have very often paralleled each other and very often drawn on each other. Uh, and indeed, my experience has extensively been women have much greater sensitivity to discrimination than men do. Uh, and now we see our legislature is going to turn predominantly women, our federal and state legislature. And it'll spread to other states, and it'll partly overcome all the crap that we face day in, day out. But without going through the long list, many of you know it, all of you know it to a great degree. When you look around what happened to women, and you've got to draw that parallel, for you to say, I'm a member of a privileged class, uh, is, is your time. You couldn't have said that 10 years ago, maybe five years ago. You know, it, it's, it's been such a immediate uh, race for equality. So, so, so I'll, ju I'll just add, so I, I do want, I, I agree 100%. Um, I don't want us to lose side of the fact that um, while that may be true for some women, it's not true for women that look like me. And so, you know, part of our understanding of where we need to move things forward is understanding issues of intersectionality and, and what it means to be a woman of color versus what does it mean to be a woman who's white. And so, you know, it, it makes these issues very complicated, but uh, we have to take the time to sort of dissect um, how race has impacted our lives and really understand it and how it's and how it's impacted different communities in different ways and even the intersection of communities in different ways. And if you're a woman who is a person of color and is gay, then you know we're talking about something else even entirely different. And so it's really important to keep those things in mind as well when you're thinking about issues of race and equity and, and diversity and all of that. I want to just add loving doesn't mean we forget about addressing the future. You had a couple of days here, you had the very excellent new president of George Mason here, who's I think the first African American president. Yeah. But if you look at their law school, uh, their day program has one African American male. In fact, the reason I know that is because his judge, he's been hired as Judge Shannon's law clerk next year. It has a smattering of Hispanics. I happen to know that because my incoming law clerk is one of those women. Um, so the, the, hard, the hard difference of systemic racism is not the overt racism. Nobody's being excluded from that school. But it, is the, it, is, it, it comes down to those barriers that exist, product of hundreds of years of the structural institutions. And so um, some of you may know, I, I'm, for I guess two years, Delegate Keem knows this because uh, I pestered him for, uh, for a meeting. <laughs> but I've been a candidate mm -hmm. for the Court of Appeals of Virginia. And the state bar asked me some questions, some pointed questions, as they should. And I told them, and I'm quoted in, in their report to the state legislature, that those of us who have benefited from an uneven pl playing field, and that's, that's white men more than white women, certainly, are the ones that sh should most be tasked to do something. Uh, about it. And so the past, the, the, the courageous actions of really uh, legendary people like Mr. Hirschkopf, and you can see how humble he is and all that, and I, I'm just humbled to be in his presence, uh, show the path to the future. And, 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 and it's about changing our institutions. Um, uh, Judge Shannon has been mentioned. Um, Judge Shannon is my sweet mate, uh, although he's moving. Um, He's moving to a different floor. But it's been four years of a partnership, and he is a member of this community. He, he lives in the town of Vienna, as you know, and he is a hidden jewel. Well, maybe not so hidden sometimes, but, and he is a jewel in our courthouse. Uh, Judge Shannon has been instrumental as a seed of moral authority. I have great colleagues, and they do great things. But one example of, of the hard, uh, differences of the of the hard tasks are when institutions like us, the uh, our court, which is still overwhelmingly white male. I mean, we have a uh, my new suite mate is uh, the first African American female that's coming in, uh, Miss Tanya Saylor, 
uh, and, and, but we, looking at ourselves, and Judge Shannon was instrumental in providing the seed to our systemic plan uh, uh, against systemic racism, which is posted, which is something no other circuit court has done. We're looking at ourselves, we're looking at our community. You've got to be willing to look inward and look at what you don't know. And uh, commenting on the law schools, you know, uh, Judge Shannon and I talked about it. You know, did they mention loving in your law school? He went to UVA. You know what? They didn't mention it. You would think it would have been mentioned. I went to another, uh, I think, quite great law school, and the only reason I got in, I think, is because they had a big map of where, you know, different law students had come from, and I was the only student from El Salvador, so I think that that's why I got in. <laughs> I, I was one of those, apparently I do have something in common with Mr. Hirschkopf. I kind of sat in the back hoping I wouldn't be called on. Uh, not quite reading the newspaper, but I had all my, you didn't have this in your, uh, I had all these aids, you know, like, rather than reading the case, you have this, everything summarized for you. And I'm not from El Salvador, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got in without the, uh, without the pin. But, um, but, it, but, in any, but in any event, um, you know, I, I thought, was that mentioned? And actually, I think it was mentioned as a footnote in my criminal law class and in my constitutional law class. And I just said, oh, the miscegenation laws and, you know, not its importance. So what we do in our law schools, um, what we do with our police departments, uh, there was an important article in the, new, in the Washington Post by somebody who joined the as an auxiliary officer, the police force of the District of Columbia. And, and they're changing their way they train. Uh, part of the problem that we have with the police departments is they're trained in a militaristic fashion. Uh, you, you see their uniforms, they have ranks, sergeants, and all that. They have fancy equipment that they get from. And that's the wrong message. You know, that's in the smaller departments, that's maybe not that issue because they're smaller, like in the town of Vienna. But that's something that Mr. Hirschkopf was getting at. that. The uh, police citizen relationships is way beyond race. It is, it, it is their taught control. And you know, certainly African Americans that have been put upon uh, are tired of just, in some situations, of just being mistreated, and so they talk back. And that's something that the police are not used to. Somebody asking, well, what are you, why are you violating my rights? And that may lead to these circumstances, and that's why we have disproportionate uh, violence often against minorities. But in any event, um, those are just some remarks that I think uh, I wanted to add to, to what you two had said. One last question. And she's the love of our lives, and, and we live very close to why we moved here. We could oh, there was a lot of after she left. It has been so horrible, horrible for her. <laughs> and you can ask any kid, you know, on the side, um, how many times do you hear the N-word? And they're like, all the time. Everybody uses it. Everyone not, or, uh, not of color. You know, they think it's like a cool thing to do. I almost got somebody expelled because it was used and disrupted the class the entire year. So, but COVID saved him <laughs> from getting expelled. But it, it amazes me also, she tried out for um, a sport and she realized that only one person of color who was Asian was chosen for the, the team. And it happened year after year class, or, I mean, sport after sport. And this is something that my daughter deals with every day. You know, and she hears things, especially on social media. Um, it's just something that is, that she feels not included. And her, her bubbly personality has gone down uh, to like feeling less than all the time, which is very disturbing. And I'm hoping that at some point, 
you know, the community can uh, really take this seriously and embrace it and say, oh, not in, not in Vienna. In Vienna? Yes, in Vienna. <laughs> and I think you probably know that very well. Um, and, and I hope that there are ways that we can, you know, extend LAM, do it year round, and, and really talk to people just as people. You know, I think that that's so, so important and work together and get to know each other, even if you're outside of the comfort zone. You know, it's the only way to, to break down some of these barriers. The other thing is my brother is, was a public defender in New Jersey for a number of years and he's now a judge. And he, uh, besides <laughs> fighting Alito on a different case, he uh, was one of the judges, or one of the, the lawyers who brought up the whole thing with New Jersey um, troop, troopers that were um, pulling over black drivers and the whole driving while black came up because they were just pulling people of color over at that time, so that became a really big thing. So um, I, I really am so glad that we're doing this because I think that these issues, you know, I look at the audience, it's mostly white, but it's good in that respect, but I still would love to see more of a blend in every way, in everything that we do in Vienna and, and all over the, the world. So. Thanks, Kathy. One of the things that we felt very important when we were establishing the Liberty Amendments program was not just to look past at history, but to bring it forward and to reflect on some of the issues we have today. And it's kind of a fitting way to end our session today with the fact, and as Ms. Runyon has pointed out to us, we got some work to do still. Uh, would, Conceiving of this whole thing, we felt that it should have both a serious purpose and a fun purpose, kind of like a cross between a civics course and a street fair. <laughs> and I think we've uh, really accomplished the civics course segment of it today. I'd like to thank our two witnesses. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> All right. So, promise I won't be I won't be long. Um, first of all, I want to thank the uh, the town council, the mayor, uh, uh, certainly Ms. Ms. Kitcher, uh, for hosting us here. I, I uh, consider myself a uh, self-appointed uh, son of this town because I, I used to practice law in the courthouse on occasion here. So I think that qualifies, but I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. <laughs> Uh, today we talk primarily about the 14th Amendment and particularly about uh, Section 1, which in involves due process and equal protection. Now a lot of people don't realize that, you know, that amendment was passed in 1868 right after uh, the 13th Amendment, which eradicated slavery. And it was a response, uh, obviously, to, uh, to kind of cement uh, the rights of African Americans but it was really a gift to us all. Um, up until then, uh, the Due Process Clause contained in the 14th Amendment, first of all, makes the Bill of Rights applicable to the states in most instances. Now that's been a slog fight by fight in cases, but uh, up until then, that was, that was in question. Do the Bill of Rights apply to the states? Could the states just do whatever they want to do? Uh, and, and of course, uh, that deals with life, liberty, or property being deprived of that without fair, fair process. Now, the Equal Protection Clause, which uh, uh, applies directly to the states, uh, has been a basis of many decisions uh, rejecting basically irrationality and unnecessary discrimination against various people. And loving is one of those momentous cases where that happened. Uh, loving being perhaps one of the most prominent manifestations of how the amendment works. Now, what does the Equal Protection Clause in the, in the 14th Amendment do for us? To me, it's a, it's a beacon of justice. It's kind of like 
when the ship of our country veers in the wrong direction, there's that beacon. And it's up to us to use equal protection, to use the 14th Amendment to bring us back. And that is what uh, Mr. Hershkoff and Mr. Cohen did. The, the ship of state was veering in the wrong direction and had been for hundreds of years. So it is a tool to defend the, pr the, the principle of equality. It's not something we can take for granted. It's, it's something that we must continue to fight on on a daily basis. But it, in its simplicity, equality, it's not easily defeatable. Now, despite the fact that you needed somebody or the brilliance of Mr. Hirschkopf, uh, which apparently he learned a little bit more than about the law than just reading the newspaper in the back. <laughs> um, despite the procedural obstacles, what the procedural obstacles tell you is that they don't want to meet. Those who are opposed to equality don't want to meet the principle of equality because there's no argument against it. Let's look briefly at what the trial judge did in response to Mr. Hirschkopf's motion to reconsider. Let's, let me requote what, what my law clerk uh, and incoming president of the long, young lawyer section, Ms. Small, talked about. This is what uh, Judge Bazile said. Quote, Almighty God created the races, white and black, yellow, Malay, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. And but for the interference with this arrangement, there would be no cause for such marriages. The fact he separated the races shows that he did not intend the races to mix. Well, let's look at the logic of that. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest interference, it w well, that would mean that Native Americans should be governing here, and us white persons should never have come here. African Americans should not be, have been enslaved, and many died on the way over here in ships, uh, or showed in incredible courage uh, on the journey. It is inherently illogical, but in the face of equal rights, what did the judge do? He retreated to a perversion of religion. That because the logic of equality cannot be defeated easily. What did Mr. Hershkoff say? This is a direct quote from his argument in the Supreme Court. He said, quote, speaking about Virginia, they were not concerned with racial integrity, but racial supremacy of the white race. So obviously they weren't concerned about uh, you know, genetic uh, uh, racial integrity of, of the black race, as that was defined. And, and, but they were concerned about white supremacy. You know, the family is the easiest way to break down prejudice. This incredible way that, that gay rights came along, that is a, not a product of accident. That is a product, I think, initially, that many of, of the conservative forces had relatives who were gay. And other than their being gay, they had the same achievements, the same, the same feelings, and it made it very hard to argue against gay rights. Now, Justice Carrico, what was his justification? And, and I'm, I promise I'm almost done with here. <laughs> Justice Carrico, uh, in 2010, he was interviewed by the Richmond Times-Dispatch. And this is uh, available in his uh, obituary in the Washington Post. And, and, it, and I thought it would be interesting to think, what is the mentality that would lead him to reject the arguments of of Mr. Hirschkopf. And uh, in reflecting on the decision, this is what he said. He said, quote, that case was decided on what the law was then, when the opinion was written. And up until that time, there was no just question that regulation of marriage was strictly a state proposition. Let's think about that principle. In other words, the states should be allowed to do what they want to do. Well, one of the strengths of the United States, and one of the reasons we have, in my view, not succumbed to dictatorship is the diffuseness of power. And you see that here in the town of Vienna. The mayor is responsive to the town council, but not to the governor of Virginia, not, certainly not to the president of the United States. The police force is responsive to the mayor and the uh, town manager, but they don't, if the president of the United States says, go and arrest Judge Bernhardt because I don't like his comments today, you know, the town of Vienna would say, you know, get lost. You're, you, you have no authority here. So the diffuseness of power has been 
a bulwark against dictatorship. But it also requires some regulation. Otherwise, if we just allow everybody to do what they want to do, uh, you wouldn't have due process, you wouldn't have equal protection. And that's where the Constitution steps in. So um, going on with what Justice Carrico said, whether I would do the same thing now or not is beside the point, he said. If I had been convinced after my research that it should have gone the other way, I, I'd have gone the other way. If you find one other word, if you find one word in there that is discriminatory, I'd like to know what it is. <laughs> um, well, in the law, we can get lost in excessive proceduralism. We can get lost in doctrines. To be sure, I've been in the, at the Fairfax County Circuit Court serving as one of your circuit court judges for four years. I have not struck down a single piece of legislation. Why? Because, first of all, our legislature does a pretty good job these days at staying within the bounds of the Constitution. But secondly, we are not there to set policy. We are not there to do what we want to do. We are there to interpret the law. But we're also there to kind of, as a check, as a constitutional check, uh, to make sure that the legislature doesn't go off the rails. So Justice Carrico's view that the separation of power, he said the separation of powers is one of the bedrocks of our systems of government, and that's true. But the separation of powers uh, is about striking down policies uh, that we might not like, but not about striking out the unconstitutional policies uh, that violate equal protection. Now let's contemplate finally the impact of loving. Um, Intermarriage, the Pew Center did research, and in 1967, when Eve's parents married, 0.3% of the US population uh, who were married were interracial, were interracial marriages. By 2015, that percentage had gone up to 17%. So if you take those numbers in 2015 numbers, that means that instead of, if, if nothing had been done, maybe we would have remained at 180,000 interracial marriages. By, but by 2015, 10.2 million couples were interracially married. And that doesn't even call, count the people who are not married and living together. And we talked about the 16 states. You know, the impact, okay, maybe you lived in California where this wasn't a problem. But traveling to Virginia was a problem. Uh, so the in, disproportionate impact of of, of what Mr. Hirschkopf and Mr. Cohen did can be seen just in these figures. Finally, uh, and, and it goes on to not just marriage, it goes on to having children and inheritance and the right to property. It, a lot flowed from loving. Finally, um, I'd like to mention, uh, I think somebody who's more of a contemporary of, of Mr. Hirschkopf and another legendary lawyer, uh, Clarence Donneville. Uh, a few years back, I had the opportunity to uh, do pro bono work <laughs> uh, at the invitation of the then Chief Justice of the Virginia Supreme Court. He wanted me to handle a case where uh, indigent grandmother and father uh, were appealing that, their that the child of the father had been adopted away to strangers uh, just because he didn't sign a piece of paper in time. And of course, some of what Mr. Hirschkopf talked about, our record was limited to what, what these folks had done to get this case up to the Supreme Court themselves. And uh, I got to work with civil rights leader Clarence Donneville. And at the time that Mr. Hirschkopf was doing civil rights work, work Mr. Donneville, who, had, who was one of the last living lawyers who at age of 18 was present for Brown versus Board of Education because his teacher was a friend of of the lawyers that, that we're arguing that, uh, got to sit in that case. And his, his description, it's available online, uh, of, of that process was, was, uh, is riveting. But I asked Clarence in the, I think we put in, I think he put in about 300 hours of work, I put in about 400 hours of work. In the end, that case was set aside because uh, the record was insufficient. But the state legislature had the last word. I, I think Mr. Keem might have, Delegate Keem might have been there. Uh, he, uh, when they voted 
I think you were, actually, when they voted unanimously to extend the right to counsel at state expense to indigent persons before their children can be adopted away to strangers. But that's not the, the important point. The important point is I asked Clarence, well, what, what compelled you to become a lawyer? You know, and he said, I went in to Brown. When I went into Brown, I saw the words above the Supreme Court building. And those are the four words, equal justice under law. So the 14th Amendment is the beacon. The Supreme Court even has words emblazoned about equality. That is the goal. It is, it is a gift, and it is a, but it is a gift that we must cherish and that we must enforce. That we, when people don't hold true, it, true to it, then the Philip Hirschkoffs and the future Philip Hirschkoffs need to intervene, and the community needs, needs to intervene, to hold our society to its greatest aspirations, because we all benefit just as a matter of having the greatest talent pool, not excluding anybody. So with that said, uh, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to address you, and, um, and uh, those are my remarks. Thank you. Let's give a big round of applause to our distinguished panel. A couple of days ago when we were talking about, well, how do we set up this thing, we said, well, let's see if we can make it kind of like a courtroom. So we would like to thank our two witnesses, Eve Runyon and Philip Hirschkopf. We would like to thank our distinguished judge, David Bernard, and we would like to thank our jury panel. <laughs> um, Robin Nagel, Rebecca Neville, Rachel Rogers, Teresa Small, Jacob Stalnaker, Leon Stern. Before leaving, I want to give Lee Kitcher a couple of minutes to plug some other big liberty event, of events that are coming up, ones which really are going to be great and you cannot miss. I expect you to go to all 30, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. Now, I hope you all have a copy of this brochure. If you don't, they're on the table when you leave. Or if you're at home watching, you can just click on the link, viennaviagovernor slash liberty, and get to the, the calendar. And later on tonight, we can have one of those more lighthearted events which will be, then and now, a musical tour of the freedom struggle through gospel music right on the town green. Then on Sunday, we can start with some nice exercise at 10 a.m. on the town green. Go see Rosa Parks at 1 o'clock at First Baptist. Last week, I saw the same actress performing Harriet, and she was riveting. I highly recommend it. It's wonderful. And then there'll be another concert at 7 p.m. at the Holy Comforter. On Monday, we're going to have a wonderful panel, a panel discussion on um, monuments and how we handle our monuments with Lex Musta. It'll be all virtual. And on Wednesday, for the little ones, we will have a special performance of Bunheads, that's the children's book written by Misty Copeland about black girls in dance. And they will be reading the story of Loving versus Virginia for children. And then there's children's story time on Thursday. And also later on Thursday, there's Richard Josie talking about becoming good ancestors. So that's just this week's activities. Wow. That's a lot. And there are two more weeks after that. And next week, of course, it's 4th of July next week. So our kickoff event will be a concert, Justice for All, on the town green. And of course, there'll be the usual 4th of July events. So next week will be fun, too. I encourage you to look in your calendar and enjoy the Liberty Amendments. Please join me in thanking everybody who made today so special. We look, we look forward to seeing you at more events.